All right, hey, what's up everybody? Matthew here, thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Today we're gonna to talk about Christian spirituality. Now, listen, I am reformed, obviously, everything I believe and teach is reformed theology. I'm Presbyterian, I'm ordained in the PCA, what do you expect from me, right? So, not only do I believe and teach reformed theology, but I'd even go so far to say this, I do think that Reformed theology is the best and most perfect system of Christian thought. If we're going to try to organize what the Bible teaches, and of course we do have to do that to some extent, we do have to organize and systematize what the Bible teaches, then I think that Reformed theology is better than all of its so-called competitors out there. In other words, if there was a better system than Reformed theology, I would move to that system and I would believe and teach that instead. But as it is, I do think that Reformed theology is the best coherent, comprehensive, uh, consistent understanding of Christian systematic teaching. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that it doesn't have its places to be critiqued. In fact, I might suggest in this video that if Reformed theology does have some weaknesses, then perhaps it's something like a blind spot when you're driving in a car. You know, you can see most vantage points from your position as the driver, but there might be a few blind spots that you may need some help from some mirrors. And sometimes those help from the mirrors comes by way of other Christian traditions. Now, again, that's not to say that I'm not consistently reformed and I don't want to be consistently reformed. I do, obviously. But I do think there are a few places that Reformed theology can at times be supplemented by other traditions. One of those places may be in Christian spirituality. Now, if somebody were to ask me, what does Reformed theology do well? Obviously, I think our strong point is that we teach doctrine very, very well. Um, we have excellence in terms of our creeds and confessions. Doctrinal precision is the hallmark of Reformed Christianity. But I do think that there is a place in which Reformed Christianity can be supplemented. And one of those places is probably in terms of Christian spirituality. In other words, what is the Christian life? Now, I realize that even just saying that, some people are going to suspect perhaps that I'm not fully Reformed or something like that. I really don't think that's the case. I just think that in terms of the Christian spiritual life, Reformed Christians do well to look at other traditions and incorporate some of their better views into our our own Christian spirituality, while, of course, jettisoning anything that is wrong or improper or, improper or doctrinally incorrect, right? Well, what's up, everybody? My name is Matthew. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, by all means, you found one, please come check us out in real life. This video is brought to you by myself. Shameless pro, uh, pl plug and self-promotion here. I want to mention my book on Jonathan Edwards and his theology of joy and gladness. It has recently come out in Audible, which means that you can go to Amazon and you can get it. You can listen to it. If you have a long drive coming up, if you're a trucker, if you spend a lot of time commuting, if you're picking up the kids from school and you sit in the parking lot and wait, you can be edified by listening to this book. It is about nine hours long. It's all about joy, gladness, happiness as it pertains to the Holy Trinity and through the mind of one of the great theologians of all time, Jonathan Edwards. So you can grab that. I will put a link in the description of this video. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a journey through Christian spirituality. And this video may be a tad longer than some of the other videos that I do on this channel. Sometimes they're 9, 7, 15 minutes. I think we might go a little bit long today, but that's okay. So hang with me or watch it in multiple parts, whatever you have to do. Let's think, first of all, about the fact that the Bible teaches something about true spirituality. Okay, so for instance, in John chapter 4, Jesus talking here, what does he say? He says that God is spirits. Oops, hold on. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so in spirit means from the heart, sincerity, not only in accordance with the Holy Spirit, but we have the soul or the spirit within us. So there's something internal that should be taking place, obviously, when we worship the Lord. And balanced by truth. There should be no sense in which we are worshiping according to untruth or counter to the truth or inconsistently with the truth. So therein is our Reformed emphasis on doctrine. But we cannot neglect the Spirit either. At the same time, we have all kinds of passages in the Scripture that speak about something of the essence of Christianity as a, a humble walk with God. So, for instance, Micah 6, 8, What has the Lord required of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? So also, James tells us that we are to love uh, the orphans and the widows, which is consistent in real religion. If you want to be religious, 
Uh, it's not just a, a system of uh, some sort of fabricated constructs intellectually, but rather there's a consistency between believing what is true in the mind and loving in the heart and, of course, carrying out that action in the real world. When Jesus was asked about what the essence of true spirituality is, or as the question was actually posed, what is the greatest of the commandments, he answered that we are to love the Lord our God with all of the heart, all of the mind, all of the soul, all of the strength. Okay, so this is an internal transaction, we might say, an experience that takes place. Could, can we call love an experience? Is that going too far? Am I am I too far off the path already to talk about love as an experience of, of praise and adoration and thanksgiving to God that actually flows out of the heart, giving God true and proper worship? Yes, according to right doctrine, but certainly something that is experienced in the heart. Or, for instance, uh, Scripture may speak of, what, loving and living with God, Deuteronomy 36, as the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live, another similar to what Jesus said as the greatest commandment. Uh, how about Isaiah 66 says, all these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. Key phrase here. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word, surely enough. Or 1 Corinthians 13, what does he say here? What is Paul arguing in that famous passage that we often quote at weddings, but shouldn't exclusively be reserved for just weddings because this is supposed to be a summary of the Christian life, that without love, we have nothing. He even says, if I can talk in the language of the angels, if I can move mountains with my faith, if I give even my body to be burned, in other words, if I suffered martyrdom, but if I didn't have love, Paul argues here, I have nothing. Well, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at several of the, the main spiritual writers here. That was a quick glimpse of Kierkegaard, by the way. And I'm going to be uh, doing a couple things here. First of all, I'm going to use a couple of AI images. So they're for better or for worse. Uh, but just to give you something fun to look at here, I, I've been using AI to come up with some of my thumbnails and things like that. It is fun to mess around with that. At the same time, let me give you a trigger warning. I'm going to be talking about a few people that are outside of the Reformed tradition. If that bothers you, maybe you're not going to make it through this video. I don't know. Um, some will be inside the Reformed tradition, but a few outside the Reformed tradition. So let's, first of all, introduce several of the spiritual writers, which is kind of the goal of this video, is to take you through some people's ideas that may be a little bit new, maybe a little, a little bit of a mirror check for us who are Reformed to help us fill out our understanding of what the true Christian experience is. Well, let's get back to Kierkegaard here. So Kierkegaard is a, a Danish Lutheran, and he is essentially frustrated with the Lutheran state church of his day. In fact, as Kierkegaard looks around at the state of the church, he finds it to be largely in a state of apathy or dullness or deadness. And so he critiques it from a philosophical perspective, which is called existentialism. Now, of course, existentialism is not necessarily our brand of philosophy because to some extent, existentialism suggests that you can define your own meaning and existence. But Kierkegaard is a Christian existentialist, and though he's not reformed and a lot of his doctrine could be challenged or questioned, he does say a few things that I find to be very helpful. For instance, look at this. Kierkegaard's understanding of true spirituality is this. He calls it the leap of faith. Now, it's not exactly like we have in the Reformed tradition with the Ordo Salutis. You know, the order of Salutis is the order of salvation, election, effectual calling, regeneration, faith, repentance, sanctification, all the way to glorification, etc. But Kierkegaard picks up on something like this, that there are definite stages of real Christian spirituality. And this will be our first thing we're going to consider as we look at Christian spirituality today. First, um, he says that most people are in this stage that he would call the aesthetic stage. That is to say, they are consumed and concerned only with the externals. They like things like entertainment, uh, passivity, groupthink. They're very apathetic. Groupthink, he means that they simply just kind of glom on to what everybody else is thinking or talking about. These people are typically bored. They experience a lot of angst, which, by the way, is one of the themes of Kierkegaard's own experience, struggling with angst, despair. They're concerned with health and wealth and their station in life, even their success. And then what happens is Kierkegaard says they move to kind of a new, um, a deeper experience, but it's not all the way yet. He calls this the ethical stage. And this is where 
a person all of a sudden moves from just kind of the superficial uh, groupthink mentality, just kind of like blobbing with the, way, the way through life. All of a sudden, there's this deeper sense in which they're called to responsibility or duty. They're starting to think about universal morality. All of a sudden, they want to struggle and to try to gain some victory in their life. And all of a sudden, they kind of come into this place of real conscientiousness. Now, at this point, Kierkegaard says that they will then become religious, or at least some of them will become religious. You might not like the term religious, but the word religion used to be synonymous with Christianity, okay? Especially in the Reformers and the Puritans, they used to speak of the language of religion as Christianity in its essence. And so Kierkegaard says what happens then is they experience what is called, what he calls religion A. Now, religion A is an awareness of sin. Very, very good, right? because you got to realize you're a sinner in order to be saved. Guilt, and especially they begin to struggle with their own finitude. They realize that death is coming, life is beautiful, it's brief, etc. And then here is the real moment for the true Christian, is they have what Kierkegaard calls the leap of faith, where then they enter into what he calls religion B. Now for him, religion B is the essence of true spirituality. It is where a person really and truly confesses their sin, they come into an understanding that he might call total resignation, completely resigning themselves to the glory and the power of God. And for Kierkegaard, the highest thing to contemplate is actually what he calls the paradox, which is the incarnation of Christ. For Kierkegaard, there is no higher doctrine to meditate on other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is truly the God-man. He is in one sense completely divine, and on the other hand, he is truly a human being. For Kierkegaard, this is the ultimate paradox, and sometimes he even calls it the absurd because it's so counter to reason and to human intellect. And yet for him, then, ultimate, the essence of real Christian spirituality is... In his book, he calls it, purity of heart is to will one thing. And the one thing that the person must will is the absolute glory of God, even to the, to the diminishment of self. I like the way he describes the essence of spirituality there. Now, let's move on to talk about another writer who is in our theological camp. And again, thanks to AI for creating this all too creepy image of Francis Schaeffer. I guess it looks like Francis Schaeffer for the most part. Now, Francis Schaeffer was a Presbyterian theologian, apologist, and of course, a pastor. He died in, I think, 1983 or 1984, actually it is. And Francis Schaeffer speaks a lot about true spirituality in his books. He even uh, has a book called True Spirituality. So if you want to know what the essence of Christianity is, you might want to check that one out. Here are a few commonalities in many of his writings. So Francis Schaeffer argues that true spirituality is knowing the God who is there. Now for him, that's key Schaefferian language, the God who is there, the God who truly exists, the God who exists in real actuality, the God who exists in real reality. And Francis Schaeffer says in some of his more spiritual writings, that every single human person has basically three fears. They have the fear of the impersonal, the fear of non-being, and then the fear of death. And these, he says, are fairly universal. So for instance, if you take a young child, you put that child in their room and the parents walk out and there's no other, uh, there's no other person in the room, then that person is probably going to be afraid. They're afraid of the impersonal. They're afraid of being alone. And so what do we do with children? Well, we give them a stuffed animal or we give them a blankie or something that gives them some sort of emotional comfort. And, and Schaefer says, you know, we really never grow out of that kind of fear. We're afraid of anything that is impersonal, which is why we don't like to be alone. And even when we are alone, we we tend to like, you know, kind of console ourselves by listening to the radio or turning on the television. A lot of older people, they have the television on all the time because they like to be around other people. And of course, the worst form of punishment in the prisons is to put somebody in complete isolation. We are not built for aloneness. And Schaefer says then to experience true spirituality is to confront all of these fears by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the fear of the impersonal is overcome by the fact that there is a real personal God, the God who is there, the God that you can actually know. And not only that, but our fear of non-being is overcome even as we begin to understand and to appreciate what we have in Christ, which is eternal life. The fear of death, likewise, is the greatest fear of man. Every culture, every, uh, every, uh, every group, every tribe, every nation 
has essentially a fear of death, which is why all of the various religions, pagan as they are throughout the, the world, they try to in some way give a story that overcomes the fear of death. And of course, Schaefer says, well, the true overcoming of the fear of death is in the resurrection of Jesus. So Schaefer says to know the God who is there, the real God, the true God, is the essence of Christian spirituality. And in one place he calls this the substantial healing of the total person. So when the person is completely and really healed, he doesn't mean, by the way, the physical body being healed. He's talking about these three fears, the fear of the impersonal, the fear of non-being, and the fear of death being overcome. And so for Francis Schaeffer then, true spirituality is exhibiting the mark. And for him, the mark is Christian love. And he takes that from John 13, 35, the mandatum novum, the new commandment I give you to love. So here's a classic Schaefferian phrase here from his book, True Spirituality. This is where true worship is found, not in stained glass windows, candles, or altar pieces. It kind of sounds like Kierkegaard there. Not in contentless experiences, right? Like the Eastern religions, but rather in communion with the God who is there. Commun communion for eternity and communion now with the infinite personal God as Abba, Father. Okay, so there's Francis Schaeffer. Now, he is in the Reformed tradition. We're going to look at a few other authors and writers who are not in the Reformed tradition here as we move on next to A.W. Tozer. Okay, again, thanks to AI for creating this interesting picture of A.W. Tozer. Now, Tozer is a fellow Akronite. I, too, was born in Akron, Ohio. Uh, A.W. Tozer comes from Akron. In fact, his his tomb, his grave, is not too terribly far from my in-law's house. So whenever we go to my in-laws, occasionally I will stop by the grave of A.W. Tozer just for the sake of historical curiosity. Tozer is a, a spiritual writer. He ended up doing most of his pastoral ministry in the city of Chicago, not necessarily Akron. But Tozer is somebody that I do think Reformed people would do well to read. Again, he's outside of our tradition. It's not necessarily that his doctrine is bad. It's just that his doctrine is not the focus of his writings. In fact, Tozer will often talk somewhat diminutively, diminutively, uh, dismissively about doctrine because he's afraid that too many people only go to the point of doctrine but no experience of the uh, the actual essence of God in terms of their heart experience. So whenever Tozer t seems to be talking against doctrine, it's not that, not that he hate doc hates doctrine or that he despises it, but he thinks that doctrine is something like a wall that many people don't ever get past or get over or get through. Of course, the point of doctrine is to know the true God, and I think Tozer would acknowledge that. But one of his greater pieces is a short book called The Pursuit of God. I'm reading it right now. It's only about 90 pages or so, and I do read it every five years or something like that. Tozer, in the essence of his teaching, is that man is in the pursuit of God. In fact, Tozer would commonly look at verses like this, Psalm 63, 8, my soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. A beautiful psalm there, Psalm 63. Or Psalm 42, another one that speaks of the soul's longing for God. As the heart panteth after the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before the Lord? Okay, so so for Tozer, the essence of true spirituality is the pursuit of God. Now, again, this is something of a paradox because first he acknowledges that it is only the soul that pursues God when God first pursues the soul. Okay, so he calls it by the Methodist language of prevenient grace, which we reform people are like, uh, eh, that's not necessarily our terminology, but we get the point, right? So God is the initiator. God is the one who draws first. John 6, 44, John 6, 65, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. Tozer acknowledges that. But he does say this too, that the more God draws us, the more we desire God, the more we want to pursue after God ourselves. And so there's something of an irony here, and that the more God draws us, the more we want him, the more we want him, uh, the more we experience his presence, and the more we experience his presence, the more we therefore pursue after him the further. Okay, so let me quote extendedly here from the pursuit of God. He says, quoting, we pursue God because and only because he has put an urge within us that spurs us to pursuit. No man can come to me, said our Lord, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. There he is quoting from John 6. 
The impulse to pursue God originates with God, but the outworking of that impulse is our following hard after him. There's that psalm-like language, right? The continuous, and I like this phrase, unembarrassed interchange of love and thought between God and the soul of the redeemed man. It is the throbbing heart of New Testament religion, skipping a bit. To have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love, skipping a bit more. Come near to the holy men and women of the past and you will soon feel the heart of their desire after God. They mourned for him. They prayed, they wrestled, they sought for him day and night, in season and out. And when they had found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Now, I ask you this. When you pick up a reform systematic theology, do you hear this kind of soul longing language in it? You should, okay? You should feel that because if we're right in our doctrine, reform people, if our systematic theology and our creeds or confessions are right, what they should do is induce in us a desire to sit in the glorious presence of a God like that, right? But so often, I'm afraid, and I think we can be critiqued here, that we get the doctrine right, but then we come up to that impenetrable wall where we don't seem to desire to actually sit and bask in his glory and in his glow. And that's where some of these writers do help us. Now, the second I say that, you know, I'm reminded that there are a lot of Puritans that talked like this too, okay? So it's not strange for Reformed writers to think about spiritual things, but like I said, if there is a weak spot, by which Reformed theology can be critiqued, perhaps we get the doctrine right, but don't go further into the soul's pursuit of the enjoyment of the glory of God. Now, speaking of the enjoyment of the glory of God, here's a really bad AI image of John Piper. He kind of looks like J.I. Packer here. I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if AI is confusing John Piper and uh, J.I. Packer, but at least they got the hair right for the most part, okay? Now, I call Piper a spiritual writer too, and he is also, uh, for the most part, in the Reformed camp. He'd be sort of in the Reformed Baptist camp, I suppose, although I don't think his church is confessional. I don't think they subscribe to the 1689 Baptist, and so they fall short of being fully Reformed in that sense. But nevertheless, uh, Piper is clear, clearly Calvinistic in his soteri soteriology, so he is in our camp in one foot and not in our camp in another foot. But Piper has been very, very helpful to me personally, and here's why. Because his language of Christian hedonism has been kind of an aha moment for me as I've studied even the works of Edwards. So a lot of people say Piper is the gateway into Jonathan Edwards, right? So when he calls it Christian hedonism, um, the soul's longing for God, especially in terms of gladness and joy, you know, a lot of people critiqued Piper for using that language because hedonism is typically associated with the pursuit of worldly pleasure, which is to say the pleasure of wine or the pleasure of sex or the ple pleasure of riches and material things. But Piper never meant any of that. In fact, if you read his book, Desiring God, nothing could be clearer than the fact that he was making a total break from the worldly concept of hedonism. But Piper does say, and I'm going to quote from Desiring God here, that his conception of true spirituality can be kind of articulated in these four or five main points. First, the soul does long to be happy and it is a universal human experience, and it's good and not sinful to desire to be happy. Now, a lot of people kind of, you know, bristle at that because they think of, well, you're supposed to deny yourself and take up your cross. And that's that's true, too, from another perspective, of course. But Piper latches on to the idea that God did create the soul to be happy. And that's why all people experience the longing for satisfaction or gladness or happiness. Given all things being equal, we'd rather be happy than sad, okay? Secondly, we should never try to deny or resist our longing to be happy as though it were a bad impulse. Instead, okay, now that's questionable too, right? But instead, we should seek to intensify this longing and nourish it with whatever will provide the deepest and most enduring satisfaction, okay? So following his logic here, it's not wrong to desire to be happy, but you should desire to be happy in the things that bring the greater and more ultimate happiness. Next. The deepest and most enduring happiness is found only in God. And listen to this key language, not from God, but in God. Okay, so he has to draw that line there. 
because you could say that all of those things, wine and, and sex and drink and material possessions come from God. But he says, wait, 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 we're, we're not there yet. It's not from God, but in God. This is where the Christian hedonism must fully be articulated. Because fourthly, the happiness we find in God reaches its consummation when it's shared with others in the manifold ways of love. And then this brings us to his fifth point here. To the extent that we try to abandon the pursuit of our own pleasure, we fail to honor God and love people. To put it positively, the pursuit and pleasure is a necessary part of all worship and virtue. That is, and here he's going to paraphrase the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Now notice the slight tweak on the confessional language. The confession says, glorify God and enjoy him forever. But Piper says, nope, it's by glorifying God that we do enjoy him forever. Those two things are mutually one and the same, okay? Now, where does Piper get all of this idea? Well, a lot of it he draws from Jonathan Edwards, which is his dead theological mentor as well as my dead theological mentor. But I think he's right here that we do well when we pursue ultimate joy and happiness as long as we're sure that that ultimate joy and happiness is rooted in God, the person of God, and not just the things that God gives us. And of course, this is taught through Throughout the Bible, we have Psalms like Psalm 4 7 or Psalm 16 11 or Romans 14 17, which do teach us that there is real joy and gladness in the person and the love of the Lord. Now, here's Thomas Akempis. I have no idea if this actually looks like him again. AI art here. Oh, sorry, Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence, true spirituality is practicing the presence of God. Now, this is a short little book. We'll talk about Akempis here in a minute. But this is essentially, again, a Roman Catholic guy, right? So here I'm going to get smashed in the comments by those who say you, you can't or shouldn't study the, the Catholics. And uh, of course, we're going to disagree ardently with them on doctrinal issues, of course, justification and other things. But can we learn something from them about spirituality? I would argue there's some room there for it. Yeah, we could grow. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, pray without ceasing. And this is essentially what Brother Lawrence tried to do in the monastery. Now, he was a simple cook. He worked in the kitchen. It was a very inglorious position. A lot of the monks, you know, they tended gardens or simply did a physical labor, things like that, as they were contemplating and thinking. And Brother Lawrence, there's a little book, actually it's not so much by him as about him, in which is described this idea of constant awareness of the presence of God in your life. Practicing the presence of God, he calls it. Here's a quote. The most holy and necessary practice in our spiritual life is the presence of God. That means finding constant pleasure in his divine company, speaking humbly and loving with him at all seasons, at every moment, without limiting the conversation in any way. This is especially important in times of temptation, sorrow, separation from God, and even in times of unfaithfulness and sin. Okay, so that's interesting there. So Brother Lawrence says that true spirituality is that the Christian heart is constantly aware that God is with us, God is around us, God is near to us. And rather than kind of having that internal dialogue in which the mind is just kind of like thinking its own lines of thoughts, uh, you probably do this in your mind. You, you constantly have some dialogue going on. Maybe you're reviewing previous conversations with other people. Maybe you're imagining what you're going to do that day or, or some memory or something like that. Brother Lawrence teaches that the, the real essence of Christian spirituality is to turn that kind of negative or internal dialogue to praying without ceasing, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And so Brother Lawrence's idea is that you should be constantly cultivating this internal conversation, not with yourself or with your own mind or with your anxieties or rehearsing your fears, but rather speaking to the Lord all the time about absolutely everything. Okay, Thomas Akempis, similar writer here, his great book, The Imitation of Christ, asserts that true spirituality is simply contemplating and imitating the life of Jesus Christ. Who could argue with that? Nobody could argue with that, I don't think. Uh, he says, let our chief endeavor therefore be to meditate upon the life of Jesus Christ. Now, here's another one. Now, this is going to be probably my most controversial writer yet, Julian of Norwich. Now, Julian is very interesting because a couple of things here. First of all, she is the oldest known female writer in the English language. Okay, so as far as English writing goes, uh, you have a 
a lot of old English stuff. She's the, as far back as we can take, English writing for a female, which makes her a Guinness Book of World Records holder to some extent. Her book called Showings for Reform People is going to be wildly controversial, okay? Because here she's going to talk a lot about images or visions of Jesus Christ, which are going to be disturbing to a lot of us. Now, her background, though, I think I should explain a little bit because sometimes we hold people to the standard of modern day um, understandings. And in our case, you and I, look, we have Bibles. I have Bibles all over this office. We have uh, a, a complete Bible. I have multiple translations. I've got a bunch of Bibles over here. Please understand that in the 1300s, not everybody had the ESV study Bible or the John MacArthur study Bible or whatever study Bible you have in your hand. A lot of Christianity was simply the memorizing of texts or hearing texts read or chanted. Remember, this is long before the printing press, so please don't hold her to the standard of why doesn't she talk like John Calvin and his Institutes of Christian Religion. She would have never had a chance to read any of that stuff. I'm not even sure she owned a Bible, okay? But what she was was a Christian who spent her entire life meditating on Christ. And she was an anchoritis, which is basically something like a nun who spends their whole life in a, basically a chamber or like a cell, not a very big room, but probably smaller than this room that I'm sitting in right now, thinking about praying to and contemplating Jesus. So she had some kind of near-death experience, as far as I remember her biography, at about the age of 30 or so. And so in her book, Showings, in which she writes out her experiences, she has all kinds of strange visions, the kinds of things that her charismatic and Pentecostal friends might latch on to, but we reform people would be highly suspicious of. In fact, uh, we were probably right to be highly suspicious of those things. If you haven't listened to my recent sermon on Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19 about do not add to or take away from the word of God, you might want to listen to that sermon because I do critique our Pentecostal and Roman Catholic friends on this particular issue. But nevertheless, her main desire is to contemplate the glories of Jesus and the glories of God. So here's a portion of her book, Showings, one of the oldest writers in English from a female that we have. He, that is the Lord, showed me something small, no bigger than a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, and I perceived that it was as round as any ball. Okay, so she has this vision of this, it's called the hazelnut vision. This is kind of a famous section of her book showings. I looked at it and I thought, what can this be? And I was given this general answer, it is everything which I have made. I was amazed that it could last, for I thought that it was so little and that it could suddenly fall into nothing. And I was answered in my understanding it lasts and always will because God loves it. And thus everything has been through the love of God. And in this little thing, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it. The second, that God loves it. And the third, that God preserves it. But what is that to me? It is that God is the creator and the lover and the protector. For until I am substantially united to him, I can never have love or rest or true happiness, okay? Now, set aside the fact that she has very strange visions of Jesus bleeding and things like that. She tends to have these, maybe they were tied in some way to her illness or her physical sickness. She has these very demonstrative experiences of imagining Jesus in the mind, which, you know, we would be somewhat concerned with as Reformed people. We don't want to invent any words of God or anything like that. Again, I referenced you to my sermon on Revelation 22, 17 to 20, especially on verses 18 and 19. Uh, but she does get it here, I think, at the end of this vision. She says, God is the creator and the lover and the protector. And I am substantially, for until I am substantially united to him, I can never have love or rest or true happiness. Look, she's absolutely right there. Now, let's move on to Edwards. We have a couple more here. Jonathan Edwards in his book, uh, The Nature of True Virtue, says that true Christian spirituality is benevolence to being in general. Now, I would consider Edwards in our tradition, of course, as Reformed people here, but his book, The Nature of True Virtue, is a little bit unusual for Jonathan Edwards because he really doesn't quote scripture at all. Here, he's trying to do his best to do the work of philosophy. Edwards is trying to do his best to answer back to the Enlightenment's obsession with humanism, which is to say that there can be any kind of real human experience apart from God. Edwards says, no, that's impossible. 
He says that the nature of true spirituality is what he's going to call benevolence to being in general. Now, benevolence is obviously goodwill or disposition towards. In fact, he defines it as something like benevolence being love is the true beauty that proceeds from the heart. It's being concerned with another's well-being and delighting in one's happiness. But for Edwards, as something of an idealist, Edwards believes that real existence is God, the mind of God, and the minds that he has made. Now, this is one of those weird areas where Edwards is a little bit strange, but he's something of an idealist in that he thinks that the the essence of actual reality is that God exists, God is essentially spirit, God is mind, and that the truest essence of the created order is the minds that God has made. I'm not sure that Edwards would say that this desk is real in any kind of sense. Um, But Edwards says then that true virtue is loving God above all else. Now, we'll talk some other time about Edwards' strange idealistic philosophy. But um, Edwards would say that there is no virtue apart from loving God. You cannot have any, anything like a real moral virtue unless you, first of all, admit that there is a God and that that God, the Lord God, has uh, the sum of all essence in himself. He is the creator, the sustainer, and the Lord. Everything is subject to him. And if you deny that, it will be impossible then for you to love any of his creatures. And so the conclusion that Edwards draws from this is that love should be disinterested. In other words, love for the sake of the other. So first, as it regards God, we love God because he is and because he's glorious. Again, apart from anything he may give us as gifts, true love should be loving and adoring the God that actually exists, the real sovereign creator over all things. But then Edwards extrapolates from that, that true virtue is not only loving the God who exists, but also loving the other creatures, the intelligent beings that God has made. And herein is Edwards's breakthrough idea of disinterested benevolence. And some of his, uh, his own students would take this even further than Edwards does. But Edwards says, if you love someone really, You have to love them apart from anything that they can do for you or might give you back. So in other words, if you love people only because they can be beneficial to you in some way, well, that's nothing better than the pagans, right? The pagans love their own nations. The pagans love their own parties, their own families, etc., because there's, there's mutual benefit there from those kinds of relationships. But Edward says the nature of true virtue is that you love with a disinterested love. In other words, for that person's own best interest aside from whatever they can do for you. That, for Edwards, is the truest and realist form of love. Okay, so what have we learned here? Well, hopefully something, I guess. Hopefully we've learned something in this brief exposition of the spiritual writers. One of the things that I hope that we've learned is that it is okay for Reformed thinkers to occasionally go outside of Reformed systematic theologies and read other writers from other traditions because Again, something like the blind spots in a car, there are some areas that Reformed theology can be supplemented. Now, obviously, we would disagree with anyone who disagrees with us on doctrine and all things considered. Stick with your confessional standards, yes. But sometimes other writers can say things that help us to process what it means to experience the love of God in terms of our worship, in terms of our prayer life, and even in terms of loving other people. And that's where I think writers like Kierkegaard and like Julian of Norwich and like Tozer and Brother Lawrence, they do have something very, very helpful to say. Again, if you're going to read any one of these books, I would suggest maybe you start with A.W. Tozer's The Pursuit of God. It's a short book. I will post a link in the description of this video. That notwithstanding, don't forget too, and let me just end with this, that if you're interested in love and joy and gladness and happiness, how about this book, A Theology of Joy, Jonathan Edwards and Eternal Happiness in the Holy Trinity on Audible. I'll post that in the Uh, description to this video as well. Okay, thanks for checking in. That's all I've got for you today. We went something like almost 40 minutes on this topic, but hopefully it benefited you. Thanks. Love you lots. Talk to you later.